Of a, a lot, lot of really, really useful, useful traits, traits for a predator. predator. It, it had, had powerful, powerful jaws, jaws with, with pretty sharp, sharp teeth. teeth. It, it had, had large claws on its hand, very good for gripping and tearing. tearing. So, so it combined a lot of useful traits, traits as, as a hunter. Allosaurus has got relatively long arms for a big predator or dinosaur. Most predators have these little arms and they're not very effective weapons, but Allosaurus is different. He's got, got three enormous claws on each hand. hand. Listen, Listen, you don't, you don't have, have big, big claws to play the piano. piano. You have, have big, big claws to rip somebody's, somebody's head off. I think another, another way to look at Allosaurus is if you would take, take a wolf and make it into a two-ton animal, animal, put it on, on two legs, legs put, put Edward Scissor's hands, like, like arms on with giant claws, claws and then they make it with the skull of an alligator on top of that chimera animal. Allosaurus is a fast, strong, ferocious beast. It stood 13 feet tall, measured nearly 40 feet in length, and weighed up to 4 tons. Those numbers make Allosaurus one of the biggest meat eaters of its time. The reason why Allosaurus and other dinosaurs were able to grow up as big is because the oxygen levels were much higher back then than they are today. And so dinosaurs were able to extract oxygen without much effort. And therefore they could carry a heavier load and live more active lives, even though they were huge. During the late Jurassic period, oxygen levels have been estimated to be as high as 35%. Compared with today's 21% oxygen levels, it may make life much easier for the larger dinosaurs. So how on earth could anyone know what the oxygen level was a million years ago? Well, the answer is amp fossilized tree We find all kinds of prehistoric insects, plants, and even small reptiles trapped within the amp. We also find gas levels. And so, and so scientists, scientists are able to drill into these pieces of amber and extract the oxygen bubbles within them. This, this is how we know what the percentage of oxygen you used to be. 
high oxygen, oxygen levels, levels also allowed, allowed the plant eaters to grow enormous, and Allosaurus was perfectly suited for taking on big game. When you look at the foot and leg of Allosaurus, it's certainly quite powerful. And Allosaurus was large, there are lots of time on the top predator. So not only was it built to carry away the animal, but also was no doubt used to pull down carcasses and things like that. We have to remember what was Allosaurus eating. They were eating some of the biggest animals the earth has ever seen. Allosaurus was feeding on sauropods. Animals that are multi times the size of the largest mammals today they have ever and they, they were bringing, bringing these animals, animals down. down. Allosaurus is an example of how all life adapts and changes to the environment. First, you have trees that can give you to outrageous sizes, and it's also what we see the long neck dinosaurs to take advantage of these all three. Camasaurus was the most common and successful dinosaur of that time. Then Allosaurus had to grow huge because his, his prey was becoming so huge. So, so in a sense, sense, you could say Allosaurus grew big because trees grew big. This is a good, good all-purpose all generalized animal, and I think that's one of the reasons for its success. success. It was very, very widely distributed, distributed and fairly abundant, abundant. and that problem was because it was generalized enough that it could adapt to a wide variety of different environments, take a wide variety of prey, and as a result, flourish. Its ability to adapt allowed Allosaurus to become one of the most successful predators of the late Jurassic. Its long, tail gave it excellent balance, allowing it to hunt in the open and in the dense forests. The landscape of modern Utah scarcely resembles what it would look like 156 million years ago, when Allosaurus ruled supreme. There were fewer mountains, and species as now know them did not exist. And there was water everywhere. Rivers, ponds, and lakes covered much of the state. The entire, the entire floodplain flood was probably scattered, scattered with these rivers, rivers with, with ponds and lakes and, lakes and large meadows. meadows. And there were a lot, a lot of fairly large, large trees. Trees, trees were probably 100 to 200 feet tall. tall. Lots, lots of ferns, ferns lots, lots of cycads, lots of ginkgos. Lots of interesting plants, but of course none, none of the flowering plants, plants or grasses, grasses or roots or anything like that. that. Only those dinosaur bones buried in sediment, often by rain flood, survived to be fossilized. This sediment provides crucial information. Different types of physical environments produce different sorts of sediment. And we can go out in the modern world to look at a, a sweet valley versus desert versus open plains, and each of them has a different pattern of sediment that's being produced, and therefore different types of sedimentary rocks and structures. Also, the plants vary from environment to environment. And so when you look at it, you'll see ferns, or herbs, or trees, or other remains of fossil plants to reconstruct the living environment. By extracting oxygen and carbon isotopes from the sediment and analyzing the chemical makeup, geochemists can find out things such as temperature, humidity, and even weather conditions for the prehistoric world. And by adding all these pieces together, we can create a much bigger picture of past climates and past atmospheres, and therefore past environments. Throughout the Jurassic period, the Earth's climate was hot and humid. This is creating a super-sized world. Today, trees in Utah reach a temperature of 40 feet. During the Jurassic era, they were 140 feet, fueled by the abundance of water and oxygen. This lush environment provided a banquet of food for the plant-eating dinosaurs, who in turn became a banquet of cells for new species of meat eaters. The top meat eater of its time was Allosaurus, more advanced in both brain and brawn in its competition. It literally ate them into extinction. One of the main competitors of Allosaurus was Ceratosaurus. Now, Ceratosaurus had appeared over long before the first Allosaurus showed up. But towards, towards the end, end of Jurassic, Jurassic we, we find fewer, fewer and fewer, fewer skeletons, skeletons of Ceratosaurus, but more, more and more skeletons of Allosaurus. This suggests that Allosaurus was out competing Ceratosaurus and ultimately displaced it as, as the top predator of its time. Allosaurus had little trouble with dispatching its rivals. But they made you slow and tight in new surrounds. By the end of the Jurassic, the planet was beginning to cool. As the comets continued to 
earthquake hard, it changed the ocean currents. This is turn had various effects on the weather. Now, now change in the weather may not sound like a big deal, deal but, but every single life form owes its existence to the environment. And when, and when that environment, environment changes, it sets into motion a series of things that start to fall like dominoes. And the bigger you are, the harder you fall. Require large amounts of food and water to survive. Even a slight drop in temperature would, over time, reduce its food supply enough to spell extinction. For 11 million years, Allosaurus ruled Western North America as the undisputed biggest killer. But its inability to adapt to the changing environments of the late Jurassic would open the door for a smaller, faster problem. One that was terrifying and supported a weapon unlike anything before. With temperatures dropping, the first ice caps the oceans cooled, and seasonal changes in weather patterns began. The entire face of the planet changed, and the dinosaurs were dramatically affected. At the end of the Jurassic period, the Earth had begun to cool. Dinosaurs, Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus, Camosaurus, and Stegosaurus were unable to adapt to these changing environments, and it ultimately wiped them from the fossil record. A change in the climate usually means a change in plant life. If the herbivores can't eat these new plants, then they perish. Then the predators have to prey on, and they die too. Over the next 90 million years, a new era called the Cretaceous period dawned. Broader leaf plants that could tolerate seasonal weather changes cover the landscape. Only the most adaptable, intelligent herbivores were able to adjust, which meant the meat eaters had to adapt as well. For the first time, brains over brawn became the key to success, which ushered in the era of the raptor. The Utah Raptor was a big example. It was still fairly large, but the trend towards the eagle was smarter was clear. In some ways, the Utah Raptor provides a missing link in the chain of Raptor evolution. When the Utah Raptor was found, it was pretty significant, because up until that point, the largest of the Raptor dinosaurs found was Dionysus, which was about the size of a Timberwolf. And here comes one with similar sort of anatomy, but bigger than a bear, or at least the size of a big grizzly polar bear, a truly monster-sized Raptor dinosaur. Pound for pound, this is the most terrifying dinosaur that ever walked the Earth. It's, it's relatively, relatively fast, fast, intelligent, and, and loaded, loaded with weapons, weapons. And, it and it brings, brings all, all of these things together within a body that's, that's built like an app. During the mid-mentation period, this thing, thing without, without a doubt, was the most dangerous and nastiest animal on planet Earth. Earth. The name Utah, Utah Raptor, Raptor means the feet of Utah. Utah. This a large, large bird-like bird -like dinosaur was a deadly efficient feat of life. Utah Raptor was a major predator for its time. It was one of the top predators in the environment. It, it would have been something like a, a big wolf or a big cat for today. Actually, a tiger would be a very good model for Utah Raptor. Raptor. He's not just big, he's huge. The discovery of this dinosaur is stunning because now we have a Raptor that was twice as big as any he ever found before. And the fact that it's so big tells us that this particular Raptor was really more of a heavyweight fighter than a Vanessa or a small one. If I were to design a quick kill relationship, I don't know. If I was, was going to build, build a perfect, perfect raptor, I'd build, build a Utah raptor because it's just, just the right size. It's the right size, size for killing like almost anything. Utah raptor stood to 60 feet tall and weighed over 1,500 pounds, which would be a top killer of the Middle Cretaceous period. Made up a lot of different individual dinosaurs. Dionysus and Dromaeosaurus are examples of raptors. These animals built a lot like birds. Well, when we look at the skeletal design of a raptor, what we see is very similar to that of a modern turkey or a rodent. So, like modern birds, their bones are hollow. This means they're very lightly built, but they're still really strong. It allows them to run at high rates of speed, but still engage in full-on fights. But a recent discovery proves that raptors were even more closely related to birds than one suspected. 
birds have really, really specialized lungs. lungs. What they, they do is they have series of air, air sacs throughout the body. body. Some, Some of them even enter the vertebrae, vertebrae that, that fill up the air and push air out, and fill up the air and push air out like a series of bellows. But for the raptors, the air goes into their lungs, but then it's distributed into vertebrae and bones throughout the entire body. This, this is, is why, why they're, they're so fast, fast and deadly as hunters. Fresh, fresh air only travels one way into its body and fuels them, them with plenty of oxygen. Like all members of this family, Utah Raptor has the claws on its hands and feet, and used them by the world-class chef to slice and dice meal. Utah Raptor has a lot of claws on its hands and feet, and used them by the world-class chef to slice and dice meal. Utah Raptor has a lot of claws on its hands and feet, and used them by the world-class chef to slice and dice meal. Utah Raptor has a lot of claws on its hands and feet, and used them by the world-class chef Claw tend, tend to be the bone more claw is around 8 inches, inches so, so with the character T, it could have been up to 12 inches or longer, so that's using our after your primary weapon. weapon. But, but like all meat eaters, it also had a fatter form of teeth, and, and then huge mammoths, huge hand claws that could have also inflicted damage. The raptors were amazingly dexterous at using both feet and hand claws. Well, picture this animal that would weigh close to a thousand pounds. We able to kick this thing with slash strokes, three, four, four five, five foot long strokes, plunge it in, in to get an inch thick, slash down, ten inches deep, and, and cut three feet long, long, and do that in a couple seconds. Along with its deadly claws, Utah Raptor relied on its teeth as an effective means of killing its prey. Sure it always has a fresh set. set. Utah, Utah Raptor had a special adaptation in its jaws. When we look, when we look at the jaw of something, something like Utah Raptor, Raptor really, really many, many a predatory, predatory dinosaur, dinosaur, we see that, that all the teeth aren't really at the same, same level, level, but rather they, they seem to be some are really poking out a lot, some are just a little bit. What that is actually reflecting are the way that the teeth are replaced, so they actually grow at different rates and at different times. These reptiles, like Utah Raptor, are actually replacing teeth throughout their life. They're actually at different, different stages, stages of their growth, growth different, different stages of eruption, eruption where they are in the jaw, at different, different parts, parts of their life. life. This, this is actually a very, very wonderful strategy because these animals, animals are actually breaking their, their, their lifestyle, lifestyle of actually biting, biting into other animals, animals is pretty tough on their teeth. And as a result, they are breaking teeth and wearing them down, down yet there's, there's always one in place, so they're always equipped with a series of these dagger-like teeth. Along with its sharp claws and replacing the teeth, Utah Raptor was a master strategist. When we do the CAT scan of a raptor skull, we can see that these raptors, like the Utah Raptor, have really fairly expanded brain. So we see the expansion of the higher centers of brain, the parts of the brain that are associated with maybe even some cognitive capabilities, the ability to solve problems. These guys have a pretty good outcome in advanced brain. Very, very much, much like the lizards today. today. Very, very smart, smart, smart animals. Don't mess with a raptor, raptor. you're going to lose. Being, Being smart in the world is an excellent way to remain a top predator. But the ability to adapt to environmental changes is what makes any dinosaur successful. And in any Utah Raptor's time, the environment is always a very dramatic change. Over the next several million years, the Earth continued to cool, and seas became more extreme. Plants became increasingly diverse to adapt to the changing seasons. Herbivores ranged far and wide to find suitable food. And the Utah Raptor adapted its hunting strategies to take advantage. When you're a predator, predator and, you're and your environment, environment changes, changes, you need to adjust, adjust your hunting methods accordingly. Accordingly. If, you're if you're used, used to hunting in dense forests, forest, and then those forests are replaced by small bushes, bushes and open country, country, then you'd better, better be prepared to tweak your hunting methods. And Utah, Utah Raptor, Raptor was, was an expert in doing just that. that. Utah Raptors stake out the migration path of the herbivores, often referred to as the Cretaceous Highway, and weave in hiding for their unsuspecting prey. Utah Raptor may have been more of an ambush predator. In other words, we might say that if the Lost Raptor were a cheetah running things down, that Utah Raptor may have been the equivalent of a lion in the sense that it may have laid away for prey and with a, a, a quick, short burst of speed, take something that it, it wasn't an animal that probably ran things down over long distance. Utah Raptor is fast. But the cocoon flight faded even faster to smaller models. Future Raptors would evolve to stand only four feet tall. 
they would rely on the chilly behind the brutal spring, and they would render the Utah Raptor obsolete. But halfway around the globe, another killer has perfectly suited his client. It was the apex predator of his territory, and is often called the T-Rex of the East. Seventy million years ago, the Earth was cooling. Ice caps formed at the poles. And winter will become harsher, with temperatures dropping below 40 degrees. Those temperatures would seem relatively warm to today's standards, but for life in the Cretaceous period, it's much colder than anything the dinosaurs were used to. The Cretaceous period was much cooler than the Jurassic preceded it. Well, this, well, this is all due to the break of Pangea and then ultimately Gondwana and Laurasia. The sea levels rose and fell, the jet streams and the atmosphere were altered, and currents in the ocean were affected. The light that was hit the hardest was that that lived on the smaller land masses. Larger areas have more buffer than the smaller ones when it comes to climate change. In North America, the larger Allosaurus can give way to the small raptors. The West Coast of Africa, on the island of Madagascar, another downsized advancement for the Allosaurus became a big base to We refer to as the T-Rex of the East. Its name was... Majigenosaurus. The name Majigenosaurus is derived from the words Majunga, which is his sister Madagascar, found a dinosaur, and Tholus, which means dome in Latin. This is the dinosaur first appeared 7 million years ago and lived up until the end of the Cretaceous when all dinosaurs went extinct about 65 million years ago. Its remains are only found on the island of Madagascar, but it has relatives in South America. That proves that at one time, Africa, Madagascar, India, and South America were all connected in the supercontinent of Pangaea. Much of the Tholus belonged to a family of dinosaurs called the Allosaurus. This family of dinosaurs shares several characteristics. The Apelosaurus are a group of eating dinosaurs, descendants of creatures similar to Ceratosaurus from the Jurassic period. The Apelosaurus tend to have relatively short faces, they tend to have very thick snouts, and then very short, bizarre arms, where their hands were very, very small, and the forearms were shrunken up, so they're basically just wrists. The Abelosaurus started off as sort of a secondary predator, a middling sized predator in the southern continents. But in the late Cretaceous, when the Allosaurus was finally all dried out, the Abelosaurus took over. And if you were in South America, or Africa, or India, or Madagascar, your greatest fear would be an Abelosaurus. Some of the early descriptions said it's a face that only a mother could love. It's a very ugly, rugose headed dinosaur. Its names are completely covered with lots of little pits and divots in the skull. It's a very ugly dinosaur, but very cool looking dinosaur to paleontologists. Along with its unusual hideous face, Majungatholus sported a horn that jutted out from the middle of its forehead. Ironically, this menacing spike may have served an important social function. When the, when the first, first really nice, nice skulls of the jungle were found, found one, one of the things, things that was very apparent, apparent was that there, there was, was this very complicated and rough-looking bump on top of its head. Now, we, now see, we see that lots of different kinds of dinosaurs, dinosaurs including many, many kinds of predatory, predatory dinosaurs, dinosaurs, like the Ceratosaurus, and Allosaurus, and even some specimens in Tyrannosaurus, have various kinds of, of, of horn-like horn structures or bumpy structures on their head. I think that the majority of these theropod dinosaurs have display structures on their head. They're probably related to identification of the animal. So the potential animal males can identify them. There's a male who is going after your female, so the ones you're interested in. Or they can also tell the female that you're the right age and you're of interest. The extreme appearance of a judge of those may also be something of a peak of nature. Anytime, Anytime we have a small, small population of animals isolated in a small area, area you can't, can't help but get inbreeding in between family members. members. Over long, long periods of time and new generations, generations, we start to see mutations caused by inbreeding. Now, in, in the case of the Jungatholus, so few skeletons have been found that we really don't know what normal looks like for this particular species. But we can certainly suggest that because it lived on an island and it was separated from other similar dinosaurs, its ugly face could have been in its own mutation. The Majungatholus was small compared to the name of the dinosaurs of the Jurassic period. But it was still substantial in size. 
It stood, stood 9 feet, feet tall, was 28, 28 feet, feet long, and weighed 1 ton. ton. On the, the tiny island, island of Madagascar, Madagascar it was, was the biggest predator, predator by, by far. far. Its, its jaw, jaw structure, structure made it a particularly potent killer. killer. Majungle, Majungle Soul, Soul has, has a very, very, very interesting, interesting skull. skull. It's not, not only short and very high, high but, but the bones of the skull are interlocking. Now, now that's, that's important, important to know because, because most, most therapists, most, most eating dinosaurs, dinosaurs have very, very kinetic, kinetic skulls, skulls, where their skulls will actually move while they're eating and help protect the teeth from breaking the bones of the skull from breaking. And also, their, their jaws expand, expand and they open the mouth. But, but Majungafolus did not have, have that ability, ability. So, so it was, was really a skull that was solid and had very, very little, little if any, any movement. Majungafolus' strength would be a very powerful flight. It was a short, powerful skull with a rather powerful neck. If it could clamp down on something and bite on it, it could deliver a really nasty boom from that. He's, He's got, got a big, big, thick bulldog head, head, and it's, it's perfectly designed for grasping prey and crushing it. His, His teeth, teeth are also designed to take a lot more pressure, pressure than, than many other predatory, predatory dinosaurs. dinosaurs. They, they were blade-like, blade but not so thin, thin that they would break them. His, His teeth are its number one, one weapon. weapon. Its, its secondary weapon, weapon would be the claws, claws on its foot. foot. They, they use their feet the way modern birds use their feet. Look at an eagle. An eagle can grasp prey with its foot. Well, Majungafolus could do the same thing. He could grasp it to hold it, and then he use those teeth to rip chunks out. For nine million years, Majungafolus ruled Madagascar. But as temperatures around the world continue to cool, the Majungafolus is not fast or smart enough to survive. Because the summer saw a drought of devastating intensity. New species of plant animals were formed. These herbivores were smarter, more adaptable, and could survive in a variety of temperatures. Once again, meat eaters had to change to keep up. In Canada, where the winters were cold and dark, and the summers were deadly arid, a faster, savage cousin of T. Rex was on the rise, and it was smart enough to hide in the pass. And behind that, a, a very, very fast, fast moving body. body. And, and as, as far as tyrannosaurus go, Albertosaurus is pop up among, among the fastest. So, so a T Rex is the SUV, SUV or the, the Mack truck, truck version. version. Albertosaurus is the sports car. car. Same, Same basic design, design, but sleeker, more elegant, and, and almost, almost like faster, faster as an adult. adult. With its massive head, powerful jaws, and elongated teeth, it's easy to mistake this dinosaur for its relative, Tyrannosaurus rex. But Albertosaurus preceded its cousin by almost 10 million years. Albertosaurus is a more primitive Tyrannosaurus, so that for a scientist, we can actually distinguish them without any trouble whatsoever. But to a person just looking at the animal from the outside, you're not, You're not really going to be able to tell apart, apart other than by size. size. I mean, a Tyrannosaurus rex, rex can be up to uh, 40, 45 feet long. Now, now Albertosaurus generally say about 30, 30, 30 35 feet long. long. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, if you had an Albertosaurus chasing you, I'm not sure you would care if it was not Tyrannosaurus rex. rex. Albertosaurus stood 11 feet tall at the base and weighed as much as 3 tons. 
he was one of the biggest killers of all time. But it wasn't no big. This dangerous dinosaur was fast. A good tracker and smart enough to execute basic strategy. A whole series of brain and ear structures that allowed us to see well, had a very heightened sense, sense of smell, and a really good sense of hearing. It's a bipedal carnivore. It's very fast. It had relative to size, size also comparing to T-Rex arms, arms, period, larger. They're almost the size of T-Rex arms, arms in terms of length, length but it's a much, much smaller individual. So you kind of get the idea, idea that their arms were, were perhaps more important, important to them, them or, at or at least looked a little bit larger in comparison. It's all up front. It's, it's the, the head, head and it's, it's those, those teeth. teeth. Those, those teeth are the number, number one weapon. weapon. That's, That's how the animal, animal defends itself. itself. It's, it's how, how the animal attacks. attacks. So, so in a fight, fight what, it what it would do is it would face its attacker, attacker and rush in head first with those, those massive, massive teeth, teeth and, and grab his prey and rip a huge chunk out of it. Their teeth are recurved, which means they sort of point backwards, and they were also very leg-like and had serrated edges. Three tons, three tons of terror, terror moving 30, 30 miles, miles per hour would have been awesome. But what made them even more fearsome was that they hung in an ass. We've got like that 12, 12 good skeletons in the southern world. In addition, in addition to that, we have a bone vest at the Farmer Brown Award in 1910, where we have parts 23 skeletons of Albertosaurus. And these are everything from 2 year olds to 25 year olds. All found together at the same time in the same place. And this is just as they have operated as family groups. So they may not have merely been very powerful predators, they may have been very powerful pack-hunting predators. Fossils of various sizes found very closely together, pointing to the fact that a bird source may have formed true families. This would have increased the safety of their young and help the bird source spread across North America. But even these well-adapted dinosaurs were vulnerable to climate change. In the late Cretaceous period, temperatures inexplicably began to climb. It pretty much changed the climate was becoming obvious at the end of the Cretaceous. We find fossil evidence of cold-blooded animals and plants that don't really tolerate the cold that well being found in the polar regions. Why the Earth began to warm after the cooling period is still a mystery. One interesting hypothesis involves the larger amounts of water that once covered much of the Earth. Rather than absorb the heat, they may have radiated back into the atmosphere and caused a greenhouse effect. Whatever the case, these changes were tough to deal with for some dinosaurs, especially those of the North. The colder temperatures and more extreme seasons had caused dinosaurs to downsize. Rising temperatures would reverse this trend. Opening, opening the door, door for one, one of the, the most terrifying predators the world has ever seen. Ever seen. As, As temperatures rose in the late Cretaceous, Cretaceous period, period, lush foliage grew, grew, supporting larger and larger herbivores. These giant plants, such as the Triceratops, also developed horns for protection. Horse. This caused the needles to develop weapons as well. The result was a predator whose name is still feared even today. It is known as the King of Dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus Rex. Tyrannosaurus Rex is, without a doubt, the biggest and baddest predator that ever walked North America and quite possibly the world. They first, they first appeared during the late Cretaceous, Cretaceous about 68 million years ago and they lived right after the extinction of the dinosaurs about 3 million years later. Their range included Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Mexico, South Dakota, and Canada, and even as far south as the Texas. T-Rex stood out as the largest predator in North America. It weighed up to 7 tons, stood 16 feet tall, and measured 43 feet in length. There's no, no animal, animal living today that has the strength of Tyrannosaurus rex. To try to come up with something that had that, that kind of power, power and howitzer, you know, like this, 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 this animal was so strong, there's nothing, 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 nothing could escape if it decided it wanted to eat. And when it ate, it, it had, had a mouthful of banana-sized teeth, designed to slice through meat and crush bone. Its teeth are gigantic. They are thick from side to side. Not cutting teeth by any means. These are pulverizing teeth. 
these can pierce through, through flesh, flesh, they can, they can shatter, shatter bone, and then they're, they're anchored by extremely, extremely deep, deep roots. roots. The tooth of the, the dinosaur gives us a pretty good indication of its diet. Now, now there's other places to turn one way, and it has nothing to do with teeth. It's poop, fossilized dung. They call it coccolites, and yes, even that stuff can become fossils. By slicing, By slicing it very, very thin and looking, looking at it under magnification, we can actually see the remains of what the dinosaur ate. So, so by looking, looking at the teeth and then looking at the dung, we can get, get a picture of what was happening in between. The teeth were huge, but its small arms were barely longer than a man's. Tiny as they were, they were actually functional. One of the things that people always mention and always think about is why did it have such puny arms? Well, well, the arms, arms are kind of small. small. I mean, they're, they're a little bit bigger than mine, mine, but they, they were really well muscled. muscled. But, but still, still the claws, claws on these hands are huge, and they could actually act like meat and perhaps, perhaps even stabilize the prey. Along with its enormous size, one feature says that he rests apart from all other meat eaters. True, but not the vision. It had four focuses of vision. It focuses in on something and nowhere to get. T-Rex almost, almost certainly had a pretty, pretty good visual field overlap, meaning it had pretty extensive binocular vision. What we, what we see, see in the brain, brain is that indeed the brain is structured to, in a sense, process that, that visual information. Much of the T-Rex's brain, brain power went, power went to his vision. vision. In terms, in terms of, of intelligence, it probably was quite, quite as smart as a house cat. cat. When the when dinosaur faced mass extinction, extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period, likely due to an asteroid strike, even this monstrous and powerful beast did to have the tools to adapt and survive. Dinosaur extinction was a dramatic twist in an evolutionary saga that began with the first days of life on Earth. Nature has launched a relentless assault against her reactors, throwing up evolutionary roadblocks at every turn. The human race is the first to face these challenges with a highly developed brain, and that is its greatest hope for survival. Although some of the climate changes that occurred may have taken hundreds, thousands, or even millions of years, that's just a blink of the eye in the evolutionary terms of time. It takes hundreds of millions of years to reach the stage where we can see the full extent of the impact of the human race. Some people look at the animals in the Arctic and wonder why they just can't adapt. It's getting warmer. Well, it's, it's not, not just a matter of dealing with heat. heat. There are other issues, things, things like, like metabolism, reproduction, food intake, and even respiration that they have to deal with. When it gets warmer or colder, people have the ability to change the environments we live in. But animals don't have that convenience. There were no thermostats in the age of the dinosaurs. The ability to use tools has helped the human race weather the ice as a great worm that followed. But it is certain that nature has not finished creating challenges to its survival. And humans are the first species on the planet to affect its environment as much as it is affected by it. Whether this will prove to be an advantage remains to be seen. Next week on Jurassic Fight Club. Gastonia was built like a prehistoric tank, its body covered in armor. Huge spikes jutting from its back, and its tail worked like a chainsaw. But it lived with the most terrifying creature on the earth. One of the first raptor. 